The hype machine is high on Oregon. It's going to be the most anticipated season for the Ducks in about a decade. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view every day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. So if you have not already, like, comment, and subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to or watch the show. Please and thank you, which today is brought to you by Game Time, by the way. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On for $20 off your very first Purchase Oregon preseason hype, jury on Dickie, Elijah rushing, and then some Nate Biddle news that Oregon fans on the basketball front don't necessarily want to hear, but we got to break all of that down coming up on today's show. But Oregon is going to be a preseason top five team minimum come the AP poll preseason rankings, which come out sometime in August. But ESPN updated their preseason way too early top 25, and Oregon is number three. Behind Georgia, number one, as they should be, and Ohio State, number two. Oregon is then there at number three, which is pretty crazy because when you look back since Oregon came onto the national stage and, you know, the the early 2010s with Chip and whatnot, the Ducks have had a handful of seasons in which they've gone into it with massive expectations. And this season is going to rival that for Oregon because They are not just going into this for no reason, a potential preseason top five team. ESPN doesn't have them number three in their way too early rankings for no reason. When you look at the returners, the transfer portal, the coaching staff continuity, all of the ingredients are there for this to be one of the most hyped and anticipated seasons in recent memory for Oregon. Now, maybe maybe it's just the middle of February and I'm sitting here going, man, I can't wait for football and I like what Oregon's done and I want to get excited about something because baseball hasn't started yet and basketball's not going the way that we'd like it to. But I look at the underlying fundamentals of, of that particular take and I say, yeah, it's all there. Everything is there. Head coach, offensive coordinator, co-defensive coordinators, all back. Veteran starting quarterback, offensive line, weapons, returners on defense, great transfer portal additions. Everything is there. So just how hyped is this going to be for Oregon going into the 2024 season? Well, currently, again, this is a preseason, way too early preseason. They're behind Georgia and Ohio State. But last year in the in the associated poll, Oregon was preseason number 15 once that preseason AP poll came out. Oregon the year prior under Dan Lanning was preseason number 11. Those those were going to be good years. They were good years for the Ducks. Last year was a great season for Oregon. But the highest preseason ranking Oregon has had in the modern era, and I believe all time, is number three. And, And that's fully where I'd expect Oregon to be. Now, Can a lot change between now and then? No. Can some things change between now and then? Sure. Sure, it's technically possible. What what if you have a major injury here or there? What if somebody leaves who you don't expect? I don't anticipate that's going to be the case for Oregon once the spring transfer portal window comes open. But the last time Oregon was a preseason top five AP poll team, which I expect them to be, they were number three in 2011 and 2014, and 2013, and they were preseason number five in 2012. And what had Oregon done the previous years? When they were preseason number five in 2012, in 2011, they had won the Pac-12 championship, the inaugural Pac-12 championship, RIP, and they had an 11-win team, and there was some guy named Marcus Mariota coming in to start at quarterback who had forced Darren Thomas out of the room. Okay, so that was pretty high expectations. In 2013, after Marcus's first year, Oregon had won 12 games, had won the Fiesta Bowl against Kansas State, which was a top five matchup. And a couple weeks prior was going to be the national championship game. Instead, it was the Fiesta Bowl matchup, of course. So that had a pretty high expectation season. Oregon, by the way, was in the top five for large stretches of that year. They were number two for several weeks in that 2013 campaign. In 2014, of course, Mariota decides to come back. Helfrich is still there. Oregon had won the Alamo Bowl. They'd gone 11-2. and 
you had a bunch of key returners like DeForest Buckner. You had Eric Armstead in there. And they won the Pac-12 when 14-1 went to the national championship game. And then in 2011, they opened with that season loss to LSU where they'd been the year prior in the national championship game. Well, Oregon was just in the Pac-12 title game, but they didn't actually win it. They went to the Fiesta Bowl, dominated Liberty, of course. But the reason that Oregon is going to have these high expectations nationally and why we're going to have them as fans is because of what they have done in the offseason. This has been such a great stretch of time for Oregon and and the momentum around the program and what Lanning is doing and the brand of Oregon and going to the Big Ten and recruiting and the portal and everything. It's all there. But it's crazy to think that the expectations can be that high. But when you have a coach who is in just his third year ever being a head coach, by the way, and you have him progressing on a trajectory of 10 wins, 12 wins, built a better team in his second year than he had in his first year, well, that has, that has to make you intrigued and excited to see what he can build in his third year because coaches traditionally get better. I think Lanning got better from year one to year two. I expect him to get better again from year two to year three. And what was the gap between Oregon and the college football playoff? It was one team. It was, it was just the one team. We need not go down that particular rabbit hole once again. But it's not exactly as if Oregon was, you know, so many steps away or they were actually far off and their record was, you know, a big facade or anything like that. No, no they were every bit as good as, as a lot of people, myself included, thought they were. Just couldn't get through Washington. But that particular hurdle, Kalen DeBoer specifically, is not there. Well, Dan Lanning couldn't outcoach Kalen DeBoer, but he's outcoached some pretty darn good coaches. Jonathan Smith at Oregon State, not one year, but the second year, of course. Kyle Whittingham went 2-0 and against one of the best coaches in all of college football the last couple of years. Those are real significant wins. And I think that Lanning, as a coach, is really, really good. And when you give a really good coach, a really good team, a fairly favorable schedule as well, I think the the biggest thing on Oregon's schedule is that they play both Ohio State and Michigan. They don't play USC. They play UCLA instead. And the Bruins are about to undergo a massive rebuild with Deshaun Foster as their head coach, who was their running backs coach for a long time uh, down there in Los Angeles. Oregon gets Ohio State at home and Michigan on the road. If you ask me, what would I like if I have to play both Ohio State and Michigan? Well, for this year, it's Michigan on the road and Ohio State at home because Ohio State's the tougher of those two teams. Ohio State is ESPN's way too early preseason top 25 number two team. So the hype around this Oregon team nationally is starting to build. Their win total is one of just four teams in the entire country that is 10 and a half or higher. No one actually has it higher than 10 and a half. The only teams that have got a win total as high as Oregon, Texas, 10 and a half in the SEC, Georgia, 10 and a half. Florida State isn't even there. They're, they're at nine and a half. The other 10 and a half, for some reason, is slipping my mind right now. And I really don't know why that is. But there are not that many teams that can look at a win total. Ohio State, Texas, and Georgia. Those are the four. Those are the only four teams. How did I forget Ohio State? I was just talking about it. I don't know. Stuff happens, you know? So, I think this is going to be a really highly anticipated season. It absolutely should be. I'm stoked for it. Hope you are as well. Let me know in the YouTube comments how you're feeling right now. Middle of February sort of time. Football doesn't have any breaking news, but it's hard to just not wake up every day and think we're one day closer to Oregon football. Spring game, April 27th. I cannot wait to watch Oregon's spring game. I also can't wait to bring you the rest of today's show. You know why? Because it's going to be great. As always, we're talking recruits, two specific recruits, five-star guys. Are they actually going to play in 2024? Have you gone to check out Game Time yet? Because you should. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. Right now, all users get $100 off when you buy a big game ticket with code Vegas100. With killer last-minute deals, 
all in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. Game Time is obsessed with helping you save money on tickets. They have deals on tickets right up to the start of the event, even an hour after it starts. It's the place to find last minute deals, and it's the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. You can buy tickets in seconds with just two taps. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Right now, all Game Time users get $100 off a big game ticket with code Vegas100. Terms apply. Just download the Game Time app. Use code VEGAS100. That's Vegas100 for 100 bucks off a big game ticket. Or if you're not going to the game, use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. And away we go into second segment of the day. This question came a while back from Tots5955. Can we get a way too early, too deep prediction soon? What I'd prefer to do so that I can give the proper amount of depth to every particular group is I'll talk about specific position groups as we move into spring football. So if there's a particular position group you want me to dive into here on the show, and I'll be touching on this a little bit today with the receivers. I've talked about DBs in the past, but always happy to go back into that sort of stuff. If you missed it, let me know in the YouTube comments or hit me up on X, formerly known as Twitter, at CFB or at LockedOnDucks. DMs and mentions are both wide open. If you want to be a Locked On Ducks insider, click the link in the description below wherever you listen to or watch this show. Join the flock over at Subtext and become an insider to get priority mailbag access, talk with me one-on-one, get my instant thoughts, and breaking news and reactions delivered right to your phone. Free 14-day trial, then it's just $5 a month, but certainly not a requirement out there for you. But there are all sorts of uh, neat perks, as I mentioned. This question came over there from Bud. Wide receivers coach Junior Adams has relied almost exclusively on four-man rotations. In two years, the team's top four wide receivers have played roughly 90% of the snaps. With three of last year's top four back and the addition of five-star portal wideout Evan Stewart, what are your thoughts regarding five-star redshirt freshman Jurion Dickey getting significant playing time in 2024? Well, you have to remember that Kenny Dillingham was the offense coordinator in 2022, but your point is still well taken that Oregon's receivers last year were Troy Franklin one, Tez Johnson two, and then Treshawn Holden and Gary Bryant. There wasn't really a fifth receiver that worked his way into the fold. Oregon still had some tight end heavy sets. T. Ferg, of course, was very involved in the passing attack. Patrick Herbert every now and then. Kenyon Sadiq got a little bit of run. I expect Sadiq to be a, a much more involved guy in the offense this year. But as for Jurion Dickey, he might have to be patient or or someone might have to get hurt. I mean, I don't see Evan Stewart as someone who comes in and isn't a top guy because he is proven, whereas Dickey is not. They were both five-star recruits for a reason, but Dickey battled injuries last year. So this is going to be his first really full season with Oregon. Now his potential is immense. I mean, Dickey can play inside, outside, yards after catch, contested catch. He's an incredible route runner. I think that's probably his greatest attribute. But he doesn't have the reps. Evan Stewart does. And and Evan Stewart graded as a five-star recruit coming out of high school and a five-star recruit in the transfer portal for the Ducks. So for Jurion Dickey, he'd have to beat out either Gary Bryant Jr. or Treshawn Holden. I think Bryant would be the more likely of the two for him to beat out for playing time. But, you know, as Oregon lines up at wide receiver this year, if you told me they come out in 11 personnel, which is one back, one tight end, three receivers, I don't think it's going to include Jerry on Dickey. That doesn't mean he won't see the field. I think he and Kyler Casper both will be on the two deep. But how often they get the ball thrown to them? Probably not that often because both Treshawn Holden and Gary Bryant Jr. came back in addition to Tez Johnson while adding Evan Stewart. I have a hard time seeing either Gary Bryant or Treshawn Holden getting beaten out on the depth chart. Maybe it's more of a split. Maybe he's able to see the field more than he would have if he'd been healthy a year ago or more uh, more than Kyler Casper did. But I, I think that for, for Dickey, 
his pop year looks like 2025 to me. I, I don't see a pat unless here here's the one thing that 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 is a wor- there's a worthy thought to share that just pops into my head. Perhaps the reason Dickie didn't play last year was because of the injury almost exclusively. As in he was never actually healthy. Had he been, he would have been playing for one of them. I think of the four receivers that I look at and say Oregon's receiving core looks like that. These are the top four guys. Gary Bryant Jr. to me was the least impressive, which is saying quite a bit because Gary Bryant Jr. did a lot of good things for the Ducks last year. He would be the most likely target to surpass on the depth chart, but I don't think that's going to be very easy. I mean, Bryant was a pretty highly rated recruit and a pretty coveted transfer portal addition for the Ducks going into last season as well and going back to his time coming out of high school when he committed to USC originally. He had a nice year, did some good. That Arizona State game, that catch and run in the Arizona State game was crazy. Like, it it, it was actually crazy. And I think he's someone who, if he was called upon to have a bigger role, he'd succeed. I think he'd thrive. Here's the other thing you have to consider. If Jerion Dickey's going to get playing time, the old expression is no block, no rock. Nope, no, nope, no, no block, no rock. I don't know. Also, I just realized I kind of made a mistake, though not entirely. You talked about Junior Adams, and I kind of, for some reason in my head, thought you had said Will Stein a little bit, but Junior Adams has been the receiver coach and co-offensive coordinator the last two years. But no block, no rock. I don't know what Jerry on Dickey does in the blocking department, but if you're only able to be out there in passing situations, I don't know how great his chemistry is going to be with with Dylan Gabriel because his top targets are going to be elsewhere. But I also don't know if he's someone that, you know, needs to work on his blocking or needs to work on his physicality because that that can certainly be a part of it. But I think for him and Casper both that they'll be further up the depth chart than they were a season ago. But still I'd say they're, you know, the fifth and sixth receivers and how often do those guys get on the field? Not that often. If they're willing to be patient, that wide receiver room is going to get gutted after this fall. I, I mean, it is going to be a complete and total reset because Gary Bryant, Treshawn Holden, and uh, Tez Johnson will all be out of eligibility. Stewart could declare for the draft. That's not a guarantee, but he could declare for the draft. If that happens and you lose the top four, that might be the recruiting pitch to keep Jerry on Dickey from entering the transfer portal. Or, or, or Kyler Casper, because if they really want to keep those guys around, and I think at some level they do, because they're both immensely talented players, that's kind of the selling point is, look, you'll be more involved this year, but in 2025, you're going to be our guys. And we want to get you as ready as possible to be big time players for us. Because if Evan Stewart goes to the draft, there's no number one receiver. There's no depth of receivers for, for the Ducks really anywhere that you look there in terms of experience. I'm sure they bring in at least one portal guy, maybe two, that still leaves a couple other receiving options open for for younger recruits to come in. So I, I think it's going to be tough for Dickey to see the field, not impossible. If he does, I think that means he is realizing his full potential very, very quickly because you'd have to do quite a bit to pass Gary Bryant Jr. on the depth chart. But if he does, right, it's not exactly comparable, but it reminds me of the Darren Thomas Mariota situation. Mariota came in, you're like, wait, how do you push out Darren Thomas? Oh, 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 okay, yeah. Yeah, I see why. Great question. What about Elijah Rushing? Five-star in the 2024 recruiting class for the Ducks, that is. Breaking him down after we break down FanDuel. You know what FanDuel is? America's number one sports book. And you can get buckets over there when you join FanDuel. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. It's that easy. $5 $5 for new customers, any winning bet, you can go pick the Pistons to lose. It's usually a good bet nowadays, or the Blazers, frankly, because they're in full-on tank mode there. Bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same-game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. You can also bet college football lines like Oregon minus one and a half hosting Ohio State, Oregon win total over under 10 and a half. However you feel regarding the Ducks schedule this year, you can bet it all over there. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on, shoot your shot, whatever it may be. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. 
So I'm going to do this for every single 2024 recruit that Oregon has landed in this cycle. What I see from them, what I like, where they fit, what the timeline is, everything that you need to know. And perhaps most importantly, the player comparison. Which former duck or current duck, perhaps, does he remind me of? So Elijah Rushing, depending on which service or metric or rating you look at, he's a four or five star recruit in the 2024 cycle. He's one of the top 50 players in the country, 45th on 24-7, originally from Tucson, 6'6", 250 pounds. He chose Oregon over Arizona, where he was once committed, Notre Dame, Tennessee, UCLA. And when I watch his film, personally, I'll get to what 24-7's recruiting analyst said about him. I think the balance of power and speed is what makes him a really effective player coming off the edge. He's got a bull rush move. He's got a nice array of pass rush moves, which I'll bring up in just a minute. I also think when you watch his film, his size shows up in a a major, major way. And I think this is someone who can come onto Oregon's campus this fall and have a chance to compete for playing time. How much, though, might be difficult in year one, right? Compared to Aiden Breland, who I talked about on a recent episode, I think Breland is almost certainly going to factor into the rotation in 2024. Rushing is less of a lock, not because he's not immensely talented. He is, and he's got great measurables. But the timeline, I think, is going to be slightly pushed back for when he becomes a regular rotation player. Oregon's outside linebackers are edge players, right, opposite the defensive end. You know, they kind of go defensive end, nose tackle, defensive lineman, uh, or defensive tackle, and then and then an outside linebacker edge depends on the you know defensive personnel that they're putting on the field. But guys who are at the position that rushing is going to come in and play, which I think is different than than Jordan Birch. You've got Mateo, you've got Tatum Tuioti, you've got Blake Purchase, Amarion Winston. You've also got Jaden Moore and Jackson Jones in there. Now, rushing was a higher rated recruit than those guys, but that, of course, is not a, a tell all as to how a guy's career is going to pan out. But the trio of Mateo, Tuioti, and Purchase, there were times last year where two players were on the field, right? Think the Colorado game, pass, obvious passing situations. You know, they, they either slid Birch inside which they could do as they as they did with Dorless for the last couple of years now that Dorless is in there for the Ducks and Birch is certainly big enough to do that you know there was a play where Shadur Sanders was sacked and I think it was Purchase and Tuioti were converging on the quarterback coming from the edge positions which was awesome because it's like wow a couple of true freshmen out there making an impact in the fourth game of the year against a ranked opponent nationally televised game everything like that it was great it was great to see but that top four, Mateo, Tuioti, Purchase, and Winston, they've got them in experience. They've got a year under their belts, and, and they were all really good. Amarion Winston is kind of an, a really underrated player on this Oregon defense, but he was there all season long, does some really nice things. I don't think he's a great pass rusher, but Winston does some nice things against the run. I think he's kind of the new Mace Funa, who was also in this room a year ago. He's, of course, been pulled out of it because of uh, eligibility. So... You know, Jaden Moore, Jackson Jones, uh, a couple of, you know, Jones is in the 2024 class, Moore's in 2023. That that group is just pretty crowded. So I think that's why it can be tough for rushing to see the field this year. But in 2025, yeah, I mean, you're, you're going to run into the same sort of problem. Maybe he comes in and is better than Purchase or Tuioti or Mateo or one of these guys, and he steps in right away. But I don't think his impact will be quite as significant as uh, Aiden Breland's. Here's what Gabe Brooks, a 24-7 sports uh, recruiting analyst, said about him. Quote, scheme versatile frontline defender with size and frame potential of a more traditional hand-on-the-ground defensive lineman. That's more what Jordan Birch does. Birch didn't stand up a lot last year, whereas these guys uh, often do. But the functional athleticism and pursuit range of a modern edge rusher, like I was talking about. High-level physical tools and immense upside. Senior season shows encouraging speed-to-power ability as a pass rusher. Wields a heavy inside hand, which is a neat characterization, that can rock tackles onto their heels. That was the power that I was talking about when I mentioned the balance of power and speed for how he gets after quarterbacks. Occasionally displays some segmented movement patterns that suggest need for continued improvement in fluidity. So that's where he needs to work in his freshman year. Given physical tools, consistently good production across multiple years, 
and live evaluations. Rushing looks like one of the top defensive prospects in the 2024 cycle, projects as a high major impact player with an early round NFL draft ceiling. Completely agree. My player comparison for Elijah Rushing is Kayvon Thibodeau. Now, is he is he the athlete? No, because nobody is Kayvon Thibodeau. But stylistically, I see a lot of the same sorts of moves. And I think unlike Thibodeau, he's a little bit more refined. And because he's not as explosive of an athlete, because nobody really is, he's had to develop a, a, a stronger array of pass rush moves. Whereas Thibodeau came in as a true freshman, played a little early in the year, played more as the year went on, but really he had one move and it was the speed rush. But rushing can kind of do the, you know, the jump acceleration that Mateo does. He's got a speed rush. He'll, you know, bull rush a guy like, um, what was the, the, the analyst name Brooks was talking about with that inside power hand to kind of get a tackle onto his heels. I don't think Thibodeau had that until his second and third year. So I think rushing is further along in that development. He's just maybe not quite as fast off the ball and getting around tackles as Thibodeau was. But I, I think stylistically and positionally, that's what he's going to be. He, he's going to be a guy who wants to get after the quarterback, stand up, and, and try to beat a tackle one-on-one. -on -one. So that that's where I, where, where I stand on, on Elijah rushing there love what he can bring to the ducks and you know if there's an injury in that room if you know blake purchase were to get injured for instance and elijah rushing steps up he's certainly someone who physically is ready to to contribute uh for for oregon's defense here nate biddle unfortunately won't be ready to contribute in all likelihood for the rest of the season for oregon wrist injury illness or, or oregon's just going through the ringers here i i mean it's been a frustrating season they have not achieved as much as they should have at this point. They, they have lost games that they should have won. The Washington State game, between Washington State and Arizona, they needed to win one of those games. And between, you know, Colorado and Utah, when they were on the road, especially that Utah game, needed to find a way to win one of those games. If they did, this would be a different conversation. Like, it, it's that close of a margin. Oregon 16-8, and eight, if they were 18-6, and six, with a road win at Utah and a home win over Washington State, in addition to the road win they had in Pullman, be a different conversation right now. But this is where Oregon's at, and this stinks. Now, this is not confirmed because it was just hinted at, but Dana Altman said, yeah, Biddle might be done for the year. Keyshawn Bartholomew's already out for the year. Mookie Cook has barely played all this season. Jesse Zarzuela, a name many people might not even know, he was playing as a guard earlier this year. He was out for the season, has been since the early part of it. Dante missed a bunch of games. Biddle has missed a bunch of time. And right when Biddle came back, he started dealing with something, and now it might keep him out the rest of the year. So the injury bug biting Oregon is just a pain in the butt. I, I, mean, I mean, it is brutally awful. <laughs> It, there's 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 no other way to put it it's brutal for the ducks they've got the depth and talent to still be better than they are but if if oregon misses the ncaa tournament goes to the nit for the third straight year and dana altman is retained as the head coach and he decides not to retire one of the arguing points in his favor will be that he's not had a healthy team literally all season and it wasn't the case last year either. And, and part of it is it's the same, you know, cast of characters and Folly Dante, Nate Biddle and the like who are struggling to stay healthy and it stinks. But Oregon's just straight up had bad luck here. I, I mean, to, to have an, a season-ending injury early in the year, Biddle's injury early in the year basically it looks like is going to keep him out the entire season. And then... For Cook to never really get back and never be able to play and work himself into the fold. And then Bartholomew goes down. I mean, that's a lot. And they're just running out of depth. No game on Thursday, so they can't lose. But they also don't have a chance to pick up a win, obviously. Oregon State on Saturday. That's where things are right now. And the injury bug, once again, hitting Eugene. I don't know what's in the water there, but apparently it's not good. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And go Ducks.